Hello and welcome to the Tea Leaves Podcast, where we sit down to have an ongoing conversation on the Indo-Pacific Century brought to you by the Asia Group. Hello, I'm Kurt Campbell. Each episode will bring you into the discussion with the most prominent policymakers, artists, journalists, business and thought leaders driving the Indo-Pacific from New Delhi to Tokyo. My co-host, Rich Verma, is unable to join us today, but I'm extremely lucky to be joined by a great friend and well-known name in business in the Asia-Pacific, particularly the United States, Japan, and China, Robert Roche. He is uh, known for his investments and his business acumen uh, throughout the region. Uh, He is someone who's witnessed the burgeoning startup environment in Asia firsthand, He's also a committed philanthropist and uh, very active politically, one of the closest uh, friends in Asia of President Obama. He's a builder, not just of his many hotels, but also institutions, including the American business community in Nagoya, which is today the Chubu chapter of the American Chamber of Commerce. He's uh, made successful business investments and operations in both Japan and China, but he grew up in Chicago and he's joining us today on Tealeys. Robert, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Kurt. Well, let's start with your background. Sure. Uh, You studied economics and Japanese studies at Illinois State University. Um, What was it about Japan uh, that drew you initially growing up in the middle of the United States? Well, I I think that the the first initial push to Japan was a, a story I heard about going to China during the summer. I really wanted to go. I went home, talked to my father. And he, so, so how old were you? I was probably sophomore, freshman or sophomore in college. And um, I went home and my father um, said... And where well, was home? Home was uh, Oak Lawn, Illinois, right outside of Chicago. And I went to Illinois State at the time. And um, my father kind of gently informed me that, well, I worked during the summer to pay for college at my uncle's construction company. And... Um, you can't very well go study someplace over the summer when you're supposed to be, you know, earning your, your fees for school. He says, if you can figure out a plan during the school year, you can go wherever you want to go. And of course, as long as I paid for it. So I went in, I talked to the exchange program at Illinois State. We had three choices, France, uh, Austria, and Japan. And um, Japan just kind of caught my eye. And it was the time of Shogun and, and all of that stuff. And um, the, Jap- the Japanese economy was just in all the news. So it just seemed like it was the best choice. So you went over there. And what was your first internship like? Oh, I mean, it was it was very different. I mean, I was, you know, very, had a very simple kind of upbringing in the Midwest. You know what I mean? We had, it was... Uh, we were Italian and Irish, but that was as exotic as you got. You know, pasta was our exotic food, you know. And then jumping to uh, Japan, it was completely night and day. And it was a sense of uh, excitement, but also a sense of helplessness because you're walking to a store, you buy three pencils and an eraser. And all you do is, all you can do is they're speaking to you, but you pull out your money and they take how much it is and they give you the rest and you're trusting them. Um, but when I first got there, I really didn't speak any Japanese, but it was, uh, very exciting, but, um, very, a little bit confusing at the beginning as well. So, so you you had your internship and you went back to graduate. So what made you decide to basically, uh, pick up and, and, and really, uh, have a go at it in terms of building a business in Japan? Well, I mean, it was more personal than it was. A business plan. I went there as a junior, a student, junior year abroad, um, and I met a Japanese woman. So, you know, and she's she's my wife today. And basically, I kept on going back to Japan for personal reasons and um, and just, you know, was pursuing her, so to speak. And um, so I went went back again when I was in law school. I spent a year and a half of law. my law school studying at Nanzan University, uh, you know, different different types of Japanese law, graduated law school, and then went back to Japan and moved to Nagoya. That's the city my wife was from. Like Nanzan University was there. Um, and one of the uh, conditions of marriage basically was I lived in Nagoya. So there wasn't a job for a lawyer, so I had to start my own business. So I started, you know, teaching English. I was doing import export, 
And it wasn't really, I got to do business in Japan. It was more of, I want to be here. I might as well figure out some way to make a, a living of some sort. So, so Robert, much has been written, particularly during that period, about how difficult it is for outsiders, for uh, foreigners to be successful in the business, business arena. Why were you successful? And tell us about the businesses that you started. Yeah, the, the first, I mean, I, I think it's hard to succeed in Japan unless you have a long-term commitment. One of the, the, the most interesting things, uh, uh, the comments I got from a, an older Japanese gentleman who we ended up doing business with was, I must have been there four or five years by that time, and back and forth and back and forth. And he looked at me and said, you're still here? And it, he seemed to say, like, no one was ever still there. They would come for a couple of years. They might teach a little bit of English. They might study a little bit of Japanese. And then they go home. And be, just because of my personal relationship, I was still there. And it was really after that time that a lot of business opportunities came because the Japanese were starving for you know, new ideas. And, 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 and America really was at that time a place to bring new ideas to Japan. And with, you know, import export was the easy one. Um, parallel import is another one. There was a big exchange rate went from 260 to 100. So there was an arbitrage opportunities to buy things in America and then sell them in Japan. And so, so as you got started, um, uh, and then you set down roots, uh, and you started to build a life there. Uh, so did you feel at home? Did you feel like this is where I live? Or did you always feel a little bit uh, alien uh, living in Japan? I always felt it was, um, it was a very easy place to live. I spoke Japanese, so I didn't feel alienated. So I could walk down the street and say, hey, I'm relatively friendly. So I'd say, yeah, how are you? And I would, you know, just have very easy conversations with the people in the grocery store, the people walking down the street. So I never really felt the sense of, uh, of uh, being a foreigner, so to speak. But, you know, I've been told that I'm a little oblivious of, to my surroundings no, at time. No, you're not. And, um, and, and again, but there were instances of, of, um, of uh, aggressiveness. But again, I didn't, it didn't really bother me. It was, uh, you know, I just kind of shook it off. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the most important ingredients in being a, a successful businessman in Japan. You have to really keep moving forward. So, Robert, you, you arrived there during um, a period in which it was thought that Japan was really surging ahead and was going to be the dominant player in Asia. You've lived and been engaged with Japan for decades, and you've seen it through a period in which there was deep, disquiet and concern about decline uh, and questions about confidence uh, as a leading nation. What was that like? So you were there when Japan was really, uh, as Ezra Vogel said, number one. Right. And then you, you saw it, you know, in, in which there was a lot of questions about irrelevancy in the 90s and, and subsequently. Uh, how did that feel? I, it was, um, from my business perspective, we're, we were in a counter-cyclical business. So it was good for us. Tell, tell our listeners what that okay. means. Like, what exactly were you involved in? Well, we, we were involved in the, the infomercial business. We, we bought TV media and we put, TV sh we, we put shows on TV and we sold products. And when the economy is booming, the cost of TV media goes up. When the economy is receding, the cost of TV media goes down. Interesting. And we were perfectly timed for that. Um, so where, where the, the general macro economy was going down, my, my, world econ my, my little world economy was, was accelerating rapidly. So it was, and, and again, it was more of a psychological thing with Japan that it really was an economic thing. It wasn't like a depression. It wasn't like so many people were out of work. It was really, um, it was really more emotional than I think it was economic. Mm -hmm. And, and l let me ask you this, Robert. So it has been suggested at times 
that, uh, again, foreigners in Japan, in Asia generally, have to be careful if they're doing well. And they hide success in some respects because they don't want, you know, to draw too much attention for fear that either authorities or others will, you know, try to uh, level the playing sure, field, so to speak, sure. or, or favor other domestic producers or providers. Uh, what's your experience there? I think that is true. It exists. My 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 theory with Japan and, 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 and even more so with China is I try to figure out what the Chinese or Japanese government is really, really interested in. And I stay far away from that. And I, <laughs> and I try to do, and because the business is varied and then there's lots of, I don't want to do something that the, the government is going to think is a, a, is a, you know, a, sensitive. A, a sensitive topic or important or, um, cause I've been entrepreneurial. Usually if you want to get into those big businesses, it's a billion dollar business. I've started with my own, the change I had in my pocket. Um, so I've always focused on things that the government mm -hmm. just shouldn't care about. And they'll, so they'll just leave me alone and to do what I need to yeah. do. So you make your first couple of million in Japan, uh, you uh, uh, sell part of your business and you decide after conquering Japan in the most difficult period uh, in terms of uh, uh, the perception of accepting outsiders, you decide to go to the next difficult market, China. Right. Tell us about that move. Well, it was, um, I mean, the, the business in Japan was was built beyond my dreams. I'm, I've read all these books on entrepreneurialism and it got to the point to where I either passed it off to someone who could manage the business better than I could because entrepreneurs love chaos. They love to be the hero. They love to solve problems. But when they build a business up to a certain size, they create problems for themselves to solve and it destroys the business. So I felt that it was time for me to kind of move on. I didn't sell the business then, but I just kind of moved on. And my children were were all born in Japan. Their mother's Japanese. Um, they were in the Japanese school system. We were thinking we just needed to kind of get out and just see another part of the world. And um, in 98, I uh, started a business in China just by investing money, the same type of TV shopping business. So we all, it was 2004, and we were going to just kind of go to China for uh, two years just to see how it, it worked out. And I've been there 14, we've been there 14 years and all the kids went to middle school, high school, and now they're all in the States, you know, in the grad school or college. So compare and contrast the business environment for an entrepreneur, the environment that you faced between Japan and China. So you're in Japan for a little over a decade, uh, very successful. And then you've been in China basically for 20 years now, back and forth between China and Japan and the United States. Um, but you're in both places in really interesting times. Right. So, so how was China different? It's the opposite end of the coin. It's the heads and tails, the yin and yang of, of Japan. Everything is buttoned down. Everything is ordered. If there's a rule in Japan, it will never change. Nothing, laws, rules, you know, conventions just don't change in Japan. China, it's chaos. It was chaos from the very beginning of my business there. We couldn't, you know, we started telling telemarketing and, you know, the we have things on a t show on CCTV. The calls were coming in. We couldn't get more phone lines. So you can't get more phone lines, but then you can get more phone lines and then they're running wires and they're doing all kinds of kind of workarounds. And then it just gets, it's very, um, very fluid in China. Um, and then once you build it up in China, then again, it changes. So it's a very- In, very in what fluid. way does it change? Well, they change the laws, for example, in, in, with the- t TV shopping business. It's a silly business, but it's, uh, it's, they used to allow you to have 10 minutes on TV and all of a sudden they decided you can only have three minutes and then 
coincidentally, they, they licensed nine 24 hour TV shopping channels. So that were public, public, you know, state owned enterprises. So it's very kind, very strange in that way that where China just, you really cannot count on it to be this way or that way. You have to be able to adjust kind of constantly. And you'll see that even with the big businesses where the 2025 initiative where China just kind of decides we would like you to give us all of your technology that you're actually selling here. Yeah. So, uh, so Robert, you're living in Shanghai. So over the course of the last five or six years, some have argued one of the most consequential periods in terms of changing political and business climates. And many people suggest that it's, you know, that they can feel the chill in the air. Uh, can you? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, describe I, that. I think that um, the, the Chinese government is trying to get their hands around commerce. And, you know, they're, they're bringing million, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. They want more than anything to have a stable society. And I think the way they feel they can have a stable society is to control commerce. Um, and there is a, a marked shift from kind of a, a balance between private sector and, and state-owned enterprise to being more state-owned enterprise-centric mm-hmm. in China. And it's, it's, it's evident. So, you know, the perception in the United States, at least among some, is that you know, Chinese workers, businessmen, incredibly hard charging, extraordinarily entrepreneurial, do whatever it takes to be successful, understand that hard work is the essential feature of success. Is that your experience? Completely. The, the Chinese have, when, when they have a goal, they have an enormous capacity to, to work towards it and work 24-7. So you got a lot of Chinese friends. But how has their attitude about the United States uh, changed. So when you talk to Chinese friends quietly over the years, what do they say about the United States? I think there's a sense of, uh, let's say, um, during the Obama years, there was more of a sense of, uh, of uh, I mean, you steal his word, hope. There was a sense that there was, there was a, 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 the United States didn't agree with everything we we're doing, but there certainly seemed to be a plan, that we had a plan to do, you know, this or that, even like... I mean, in the bilateral relationship. In the bilateral yeah. relationship. But, but as Americans, do they... do they? I, I always struck, Robert, it was a little bit of make sure they admired us, but also had a sense that maybe we had gotten lazy at times. Well, certainly, it, yeah. Certainly during the 2008 crisis, there, there was very much of a... Um, see told you so attitude this was very similar though to the attitude that the japanese had at their apex to where you know went from everything in america was great to you guys are all fools and it, it, that was there was very much of that but then more recently i i think that it's 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 changing again because of the um it's lack of a comprehensive plan, I guess, is the softest way to say. In terms of the uh, China relationship. Yes, in yeah. the current administration, mm-hmm. yeah. And and uh, do Chinese, everyday Chinese citizens, are they hopeful about the future? Are they worried? Um, you know, we, we hear a lot about rich Chinese seeking opportunities to invest outside the country, sometimes escape routes, safety nets. Do you sense that as well? Well, I think there's, there's two. I think the rich Chinese are, are looking to to um, leave their options open because they have options. It, it, the regular Chinese, I think they're all very, very hopeful. They all love Xi Jinping. They love China. They think China's number one. And they're and they there's a lot of reasons for them to think that. You know, I mean, they don't really hear a lot of the bad bits because that's not how their press works but there are a lot of good things in china and and their lives Mm -hmm. in the very you know 20 years has improved immensely so so again you've you've lived in both of these countries one of the most fraught relationships in modern political affairs is the relationship between china and japan did you experience that completely i mean when we were there early there was the the islands issues and the you know the buses of people people were bussed into the 
to stand across the street from the Japanese Consul General's, you know, office. And this uh, is in Shanghai. This right. is in Shanghai, and um, you know, it's it's one of these things to where it is not modern. It's not a modern problem at all. This is a 1930s problem, and both governments seem to pull this out to help them domestically. Hmm. And to a certain extent, you know, the educational system on both sides doesn't even address, you know, the fact that, you know, really what happened in World War II and even the role of America, what, what role. I mean, yeah. a lot of Chinese kids that I know, let's see, in their 30s, they're not even familiar with Americans of the America's uh, participation in World War Two. Yeah. So, uh, Robert, your your wife is Japanese. I want to ask you a couple of questions. You've got a multicultural family. Yeah, I'd be right. curious what that was like uh, in Asia, and also just on the, related to the previous question, your wife as a Japanese citizen living for so long in China, how did she experience that? So both of those. Well, it's been you know the the, the biracial bicultural aspect of a family is I think very exciting. It's um it's fun to speak multi languages. It's fun to travel to Japan and be Japanese. It's fun to travel to America and be American. Um, so I thought it's been very good for our family. Um, in terms of I mean, the previous answer is from an institutional perspective. There's bad blood between China and Japan, but on an individual basis, there's great admiration. Mm -hmm. The Chinese people love going to Japan. And so at a grassroots level, I think it's a very Interesting. positive relationship. So, you know, not as well known, you were, um, if not the largest, one of the largest foreign or living outside the United States supporters of President Obama, a close friend of the president's. It was interesting in a private session with me, you told me what really attracted uh, him to you initially. I was hoping you might share that sure. with, our, I mean, with uh, our listeners. I didn't really know the president when he was a senator. I um, I, I kind of, but I, I saw him and I, I, I saw him as a, as, as a biracial individual and I have a house full of biracial kids. And um, it was very personal. And I said, this is a great example to show my kids that that this is a plus it's i mean it's not that he's half white and half black he's both he's got two and with my kids same thing my kids were japanese and american so you, you kind of get two identities instead of half of each mm -hmm. and um it was just an example to, so it was a very personal connection that way um and i thought this was a great example and i should support you know, this example for my kids. So you travel around a lot. Um, you've got your own plane, you're in the United States, you're in Japan, you're in China. Where do you feel most at home? You know, I, I, um, I have a house in Nagoya that, uh, that's, uh, in central Japan, about an hour and a half on a bullet train from, uh, from Tokyo. I feel very much at home there. And, um, and I mean, again, I, in LA, we have a place in LA that, that we have spent the least amount of time there in my whole life in LA, but LA is just a very, it's downtown. It's very much like Shanghai, you're downtown, you walk everywhere, you can get where you wanna go. And um, and then the, the place I grew up in, just in the suburbs of Chicago, my mother still has our house and uh, we go there quite a bit. And it's just um, nice just to kind of plant myself there and, um, and, and and, and and enjoy kind of just slowing down a bit. Um, so I'm not going to ask you to give away any trade secrets, but y you you follow cutting edge trends in communications and technology in Japan and China. For those uh, young disruptive entrepreneurs uh, that are listening, what what are the what are the areas in Asia that are really going to be exploding in terms of business in the years ahead? Well, I think there's still going to, I mean, consumer, the Chinese consumer is coming. 
and the way and, and it's going to be a direct marketing you know again internet sales they don't call it direct marketing but it's direct marketing and the way to communicate with the consumer is getting more um one-on-one -on -one, the true one-on-one -on -one marketing and the content is not going to be mass content anymore like my tv shopping business it's going to be tailored to 1,000, 10,000, 50,000 people. And it's not going to be, you know, CBS, you know what I mean? And you're going to get a hold of, you know, 14 million people at the same time. It's going to be very micro. Um, and with, you know, laser printing, I think you're going to be able to do a lot of different, you know, support in different merchandise. So, so to do that effectively, to be able to, you know, um, target specific sectors uh, in um, a population like you're describing. Um, it requires a knowledge of consumers and and information. Now, there's a huge debate in the United States about uh, you know companies that have access to American uh, uh, mass consumer uh, information. Are the Chinese going to be comfortable with allowing? Uh, groups to know that much about people that could buy things inside the country? I think, you mean the Chinese government? Yeah. I, I think that the, if, it's, if it's internally based, no problem. I think if it's external, I think it'll be just hard to get the information. Yeah. But internally, from a consumer perspective, the Chinese are fine with you knowing all kinds of things about them because they already feel... They, there is not a sense in China that there's any privacy like we have here. Interesting. So um, so we, we've been living in the last couple of months uh, with anxieties around trade frictions and, you know, bombast between the two leaders. Um, are people in China optimistic about the U.S.-China relationship or are they worried? I don't think they're worried because I think that they they have a better plan than we do in terms of this this latest spat um i i'm convinced that 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 xi jinping has 17 moves already laid out already thought out comprehensively we do steel he does corn corn and wheat we do something else he does something i mean he's ahead of us certainly and there's alternatives now we're not the only place to buy soybean you know what I mean? Yeah. We're not, you know, and again, China does import a lot of food, but they have figured out, look what they're doing in Africa and the one belt, one road policy. They're figuring out ways not to be dependent on anyone. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think that the, certainly that the, the mass media in China is not hinting in the slightest that there's any risk for China to go forward with this. So yeah. the, the average Chinese person's probably fine with it. So how is Xi Jinping, I, you talked about earlier how popular he is. Very how's popular. He, how's he viewed in China? What, as a person, what, 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 what are his personal characteristics, if I could ask? Well, I, I think that they think he's the benevolent ruler. I think he's the, the kind uncle. And in, in the Chinese kind of, society the kind uncle is someone who is the best guy you know what i mean he's the guy who's always nice to you when you were a kid and and so the 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 uncle figure is really the role he's taking mm -hmm. and 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 again it's the smart uncle the, he's a very smart man and he's leading um re relative to the people very gently i think if you 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 are a one of these businesses that got into a little bit of trouble, he's not very gentle. But if you are just a regular Chinese person, he is, um, he's, um, you know, he, and he paints the story a little bit, but he's like the ideal leader. What is he like in terms of his personal time? Is he, is he interested in sports? Do we know, what do we know about uh, him? I, I traveled yeah. with him around the United States. And during that period when he was a guest of Vice President Biden, I couldn't make very much. I couldn't sense months about his interest and the like. Yeah, he's a very he, he's a he keeps his private likes and dislikes very close to the vest. Yeah. You know what I mean? He um his wife is a singer, so I suppose he likes music of some sort, but uh he's very very private. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. So let, let me, it, it's interesting, uh, these two cities that you've lived in are two places. Japan is one of the cleanest and, you know, uh, air quality, very good uh, uh, normally in most of the major sure. cities. Sure. Some of the, you know, the worst and most worrisome air pollution and pollution issues that we face today are in large Chinese cities. How, how did you deal with that? And were you aware of it? Oh, you, you of it? yeah, you are aware of it. I mean, there's this. There's no way not to be aware of it. I'm more relieved now. My kids are kind of gone. China was never, or Shanghai was never as bad as Beijing, um, but it it has gotten bad. It's trying to get better, but there. I mean, if I can share an anecdotal story about how bad it got. One day, uh, a, a friend of mine flew in from Hong Kong. The flight was delayed because the pollution was so bad, and I promised him we'd have a cigar when he got there. And in my office, you know, again, in Japan, China, you can smoke in your offices, so I don't want to get in trouble here. But uh, but the pollution level was so bad outside. I wasn't sure if it was worth opening the window, smoking my cigars, um, or should I just leave the windows closed? Um, so it gets very bad in China. Um, they're working hard to fix it. Um, but I just think there's so much development, so many cars, and and it, it's so, such a part of their, their growth story that I don't think they're going to get around it too soon. Um, Robert, just give us a, a last sense as you go forward um, politically in the United States. As you look at what's going on here, what how do you want to get involved in the period ahead? You've been actively engaged in our politics you're a strong supporter of, you know, you like to meet candidates and people. Right, right. Um, what are you hoping for? What, what kind of policies do you want to see um, uh, in the, you right. know, the, take root in American domestic politics and foreign policy? I'd like there to be a little bit more centric policies. I, I think that we so, need... Say more about that. I don't know what that I, means. I think we need to be more in the middle. I, I think that the uh, centrist centrist yes yeah, I'm sorry um, I think that the the Democrats and this is a term I think I've coined they need to decriminalize business in the Democratic Party I think they need to take a step towards business I think the Republicans need to take a step towards the center on social issues um, and if everybody just takes one half a step or a step into the center I think our political discourse will become a bit more civilized. That's that's a that's a good recommendation for all of us. I'll remember to take a, a step towards the center next time. Robert, I want to thank you so much for sitting down with us today. It's been terrific to get your insights into Japan and China and your life, and also to hear your impressions of this amazing part of the world and and your life in it with so much potential. Um, Robert, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Chris. And Honor and a pleasure as always. Yeah, we look forward to hearing more about your adventures as you disrupt uh, going forward. <laughs> thank you very much. And to our subscribers, thank you all for listening. Please be sure to rate us on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next time on 